I have a lot of very strong interest in these topics, um, but I'm also happy to let Gary or Nick or someone else lead the conversation and change these discussion prompts um, as well. If there's something in there specific that you want to start asking questions about, um, I know Dina's on the line and uh, Dina's uh, volunteered to be our scribe and I'm more than happy to help her with that as well. Um, but since we have somewhat of a, we have a smaller group of people who think they're going to definitely chime in. Yeah. <laughs> Nick, do you want to introduce yourself and then I'll ask Gary to introduce himself. Um, sure. Thanks, Shannon. Um, <clears throat> I'm Nick Nystrom. I'm chief scientist at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. So I'm also PI of the infrastructure and engagement component of HubMap. Um, I do a lot with HPC architectures, a lot with AI, um, a lot of computational science across the board. So I'm here to contribute to network modeling. I'm not a network modeling expert per se, but in the context of doing graph analytics and AI on it, that's where I would fit in. Great, thank you. Gary. Can you Hi, I'm Gary Bader. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto. Um, we're working a lot on uh, in single cell projects on the human liver, as part of the human liver mapping project, and um, a lot, number of other tissues and tumors types. Um, I'm one of the PIs of the Cytoscape project, uh, Trey Eidecker and uh, a few others, um, and have a lot of experience in network analysis and visualization. So I'm happy to contribute as much as I can. On this Great, session. thank you. Is there anyone else on the line who would like to introduce themselves? Hi, my name is Adam Godzik. Um, I'm calling from California and it's seven o'clock here and I don't want to share my video because you would see what the state of disarray I'm in. Fair <laughs> um, enough. <laughs> so I'll try to contribute. I'm, I'm still surfing through these sections to, to find one which I would be most interested in. Uh, we just started in single cell analysis. We, we did our four, first four samples a month ago. And I'm I'm learning basic to this point. I'm I'm strong in the learning stage. We would like to 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 model uh, networks in our cells. So I this is why I thought I joined this section to to learn more about it. Great, thank you, Mike. Uh, Mike Pesa. I'm a program officer at NHGRI. So I'm not going to share anything about work that I'm doing. I'm not doing any science. Um, I work with Encode, which has some interest in this area, and a former. NHGRI Networks Modeling pro uh, Project and NHGRI remains interested in this area and have some grantees and projects that do this. So I'm hoping to learn more about it, but that's where I'll be. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Rochelle? Yes, hi. My name is Raquel Normand. I'm a postdoc at the Broad Institute under Aviv Regev and uh, Chloe Vivani. And I just started, I'm going to be working on the Human Immune Cell Atlas. Um, so I'm uh, interested both in networks inside the tissues and between tissues. Great, thank you. Nikolai. Uh, hi, I am from Northwestern. Uh, we work on single cell lung atlas and for HCA, I guess. And we're interested in analyzing cell crosstalk and other, th other things, but we haven't applied much of the network analysis, so I'm here to learn more. Great, thank you. So maybe um, would it be helpful to share the Google Doc for everyone to see, or would you rather look at each other while we're talking and each have the Google Doc up? Is there a strong preference? I have the Google Doc up beside everything else. I'm already seeing it. OK, all right. Well, let's just leave it like this then. So um, the discussion prompts that I had written down are really based on um, the types of questions that I hear asked a lot in tumors, um, both within the Human Tumor Atlas Network, but then also in the Systems Biology Consortium that I manage. Um, so things about you know, bridging the different uh, levels of networks. So you can think of multi-scale maybe. Um, thinking about bridging the types of models that Nick builds with the types of models that uh, maybe more traditional systems biologists would build, and then these network dynamic network behaviors. Um, I kind of want to open it up to hear what people are interested in talking about and the types of 
approaches people are taking, the types of approaches people wish they could take but aren't there yet. Um, and maybe one of the big things is um, how do we use this single cell data to build these networks, which might be a, a very different venture than using uh, the bulk data that we're used to. So I'm going to leave it there and let uh, Gary, Nick, Rochelle, and Nikolai take the lead first, and then hopefully others will uh, feel empowered to jump in as well. So maybe I could start. Uh, a couple of people said that they're getting started. So um, I can give a quick summary of what types of network analysis people have done in single cell analysis. Um, so there's two major categories. One is using networks to inform single cell data, and mostly that's being related to uh, single cell cluster identification or cell type annotation and interpretation. Um, so if you have a bunch of cells and they have a gene expression profile associated with them, then you apply standard pathway or network analysis, just like people did with any other gene expression data. Um, another interesting, um, and so that's sort of the main approach in that area. And then the other uh, side is, the other category is um, um, uh, what um, single cell genomic, single cell transcriptomics data, for instance, can help um, uh, infer new or help inform network information. So for instance, um, people are using uh, single cell transcriptomics data to infer cell-cell interaction networks. So if you have a receptor on uh, cell type A and a corresponding ligand on cell type B, and you have a database of protein interactions where you know that uh, a lot about receptors and ligands, you can um, basically infer a network in a simple way. And that's pretty popular these days. Um, I've seen people try to infer gene regulatory networks, just like they used to do in the dream competitions. Um, but I don't know if that's really working that well. We can discuss it. I think that'll be a great topic discussion um, is gene regulatory network inference. Um, some people on the call might have some experience with that, uh, with RNA-seq data, bulk RNA-seq data. And then, um, you know, some of these other uh, topics that are were discussion prompts that were mentioned. Um, uh, looking at uh, dynamic network behavior, other things, I guess, would be uh, people haven't really done very much of that. I haven't seen it. Uh, I'm not aware of a paper um, that's focused on that yet, informed by single cell transcriptomics, but so it's another interesting area. So maybe other people can fill in other ideas in, and uh, other categories. Um, I think that's a fairly good start. Um, there's only other work done in regulatory networks and single cell attack seek data. Um, how much of this will have available in HubMap? I'm actually quite hopeful that we'll be able to get much of it. One of the things I would like to understand on the HubMap side of the world is in terms of use cases and what people will want, what kinds of things they would like to do in, term, in terms of queries and what analytic tools we would be deploying. And since we're in the HCA meeting, the natural duo of that is, what can we do together with HCA to make this possible across our two atlases to greater good? I noticed Matt Ruffalo is on. Uh, Matt, what would you add to that? Because you certainly are, you've been deep in, deeply immersed in our single cell RNA. Oh, let's see, does my video work? No, hold on. Oh, there we are. Yeah, especially compare, or combining the, the multi-assay, well, not multi-assay, maybe a multiplexed, especially snare-seq from UCSD, having RNA-seq and attack-seq from the same cells, mm -hmm. and using that to inform regulatory network analysis seems really exciting with uh, the other data types that we're going to, going to have in HubMap. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just ask... especially, sorry. Go ahead, Matt, sorry. No, I was going to say, I'm especially excited about the multimodality data sets that we'll have and that we're going to publish quite soon. Mm -hmm. So the question I was going to ask 
um, is to Gary about this topic because maybe not everyone understands what the challenges are with trying to use the single cell data to infer the reg gene regulatory networks. I mean, is it as simple as being as simple as being able to combine the epigenomic data with the single cell RNA seq data? Are there other challenges, aspects that need to be addressed before building those networks? There are two approaches, uh, two main approaches to historically to this problem. One is causal network inference, and the other one is a biochemical view. Um, so causal network inference looks to identify causation from correlation by filtering, like the Arachne project was the, one of the first ones to do that. And then um, the more recent, uh, most recent work I think is focused on a biochemical view where you uh, try to incorporate um, transcription factor binding site information and uh, chromatin state uh, to filter information. So if you, if you um, have a lot of information from ATAC-seq and transcription factor DNA interactions, including information about proteins that bind enhancers and promoters and things like that, you can combine that to make some kind of um, biochemical representation that hopefully tells you something about the uh, causation and the regulatory side, but those causation networks or causal networks and biochemical networks, I don't think have been perfectly reconciled, but those are the two main approaches. And maybe people have other ideas for how to categorize those. So I have a question about what you just said, Gary, compared to Shannon's overview. So the causal network you're talking about is more like the statistical uh, network that Shannon laid out, and the biochemical network that you laid out is more like the mechanistic network that Shannon laid out, or are they just somehow different? Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's right. Okay, thanks. I think so are there challenges then with the sparsity of this single cell data to, you know, cleanly lay that over in a RACNI framework or things that people do to overcome that? Does anyone have any experience using um, these methods on single cell data that they want to talk about? I would say right now we're making it available. I haven't seen, I haven't seen a lot addressing this part see explicitly. There, there are some tools that people have published, like one's called MetaViper from the uh, Andrea Califano's group who originally made the Arachne uh, method. And um, so basically those, those take lists of transcription factors and um, uh, look to see what other genes are correlated with those transcription factors uh, in some data sets. So they learn a correlation network and then use that to um, score a transcription factor for activity based on the activity of its targets. So it's pr predicted targets. So that's, um, and there's different ways of scoring protein activity, transcription factor, or other protein activity, um, like using regression or uh, something else. Um, but that's sort of one way that people have approached this recently that actually has papers. There's a, there's a, there's a few papers. Another one I think is Scenic. Hmm. Maybe we could catalog some of the ones that people are aware of in this space. Is Scenic spelled S-C-E-N-I? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to try and find some of these and put them okay. in. Okay. I found the MetaViper paper and put the link in there. I think an interesting question can be how to uh, build a network based on different data types. So whether they are, um, you know, uh, measured together like in a taxic or if they're measured apart and then uh, the different data types need to be uh, bridged uh, or merged in some way. So this is, I think, a question in, uh, in general about profiling the cells and understanding which cells are the same subsets. But also there's a question of how to build the different uh, uh, networks or even building one network based on all of the 
different data types and getting may maybe something that is more uh, comprehensive. Mm -hmm. Have you started to do that at all? No, I've actually just started. So I, uh, now I generally have the questions in mind, yep. uh, less than the experience and the answers. Well, that's good. In session one, we're supposed to only ask the questions. So um, perfect. So, so I have a question, about, is Adam. Uh, sorry, go ahead. So we're interested mostly in disease states. So we assume that our cells are perturbed. Mm -hmm. They're not normal. And we focus on differences in networks. So what we're trying to do is to see unusual networks being expressed in cells and they usually are not. Uh, because again, we, we're looking at disease states and we, we, we assume that part of the disease would be, would be abnormal behavior of cells. Any comments on that? Any tools? Uh, to do this, or uh, what's what's what would be your approach? Especially that we we know we're sampling because in this this cells we have only partial information because of of nature of statistics. So I think my question on that would be: How do you know what is abnormal behavior without knowing what is normal? Well, yeah, with every first of all, we have, commit, we have controls. With, with say, okay, so you do have controls. We have controls. We have also atlases of cells. Uh, so in this case, we're looking, for instance, for immune cells. So we have we have some standard. We're comparing to, to to results from other other studies, and we have controls. So we see that that when we start comparing individual uh, groups of cells, which we identify as being similar, we see some some uh, proteins being some genes being expressed, which sort of should do not belong. Mm -hmm. And we suddenly see the elements of a network showing up. We don't see the whole one because we again we assume some of them are low, low, low frequency. Hmm. So I'm just cu curious, are there any tools or any advice you could, you could give us on this? What, what kind of approaches would be, would be useful here? Well, there are certainly AI techniques for looking at networks to find anomalies. And those have been used in different kinds of networks where I've seen this heavily is for cybersecurity so far in network analysis. Right. That I think could be transferred to these sorts of cellular networks as well. Um, I also wonder if there could be opportunities here. So you have some controls. I've I've talked to some other groups and other consortia who don't have normals. They only have disease. That's what prompted my question. And I think also I'm looking for the differences between disease states, especially in networks, say like UDN, where these things are undiagnosed and looking for differences versus HubMap, where we think we have normals. And I think there's a similarity there too, because you're looking at the differences between different disease states. I'm also interested in looking at identifying what, what are the differences that underlie diseases that we have not necessarily diagnosed or characterized. Yeah. Mike, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, so Adam, you've seen maybe Judy Cho had a publication a year or two ago looking at, I think it was Crohn's, but some inflammatory bowel disorder, comparing biopsies from apparently typical to people, to people that are experiencing an episode of disease. And I think they use machine language classifier on single cells to figure out what types of cells were affected and then what type of regulatory what type of pathways are affected. And they found a, um, an innate immune response coming from epithelial cells as opposed to immune cells that um, was related to poor drug treatment response. Okay, thanks. Um, I assume you, we can find, you, you put the, the citation to the document? Yeah, let me go do that now. Hey, thanks. So there's been a lot of work on differential network analysis with bulk transcriptomics data. Um, I think uh, Trey Eidecker and Nevin Krogan wrote a review about it a few years ago. And I haven't seen that sort of just be, obviously, I think that's mostly applicable to single cell transcriptomics by analogy, but it's, um, I haven't seen papers specifically. There's a really about great, that. oh. I was just going to say to that point, there's a paper that was just published by Julio Saez Rodriguez in Germany that 
applied the bulk pathway analysis tools to single cell data. And I think what they expected it to happen was that it would totally fail, but it didn't. So um, I put that paper in the notes under I, which might be of interest to some people. Great. It yeah, looks so like people, mentioned go ahead, Phenic Gary, and Meta, Yeah, they mentioned Phoenix and Meta Viper and other things, so it's probably a good uh, entry point uh, to that literature because it's recently published. Great. It looks like the people have started to synthesize some of the thoughts that we've been talking about into these how might we questions below um, where that list is, and so it would you know, we've got, they said we've got 10 minutes until break, 13 minutes till break. So it'd be good to identify, we can identify a couple more questions, but then maybe some of them that we want to really deep, dive deep into the answers or proposed ways to get to an answer in the second part. I propose that if you're interested in a question that you make it bold on the document, and that might be the easiest way to convey to people we could carry it forward to the next conversation. And I also don't mean to kill this conversation, so <laughs> please keep going. I, I, I have a, a couple, oh, go ahead. Sorry, um, I have a high level question. So um, you mentioned gene regulatory networks and cell interactions as like in tissue or maybe cross tissue. So that's another kind of network. Are there any other kinds of network uh, anybody's interested in? So I guess the two main areas that have been worked on are intracellular networks and extracellular networks. So intracellular would be anything, you know, gene regulatory networks are intracellular. Um, protein interactions or any other kind of networks in the cell. That's the traditional area of systems biology. And then the cell-cell interactions represents a little bit of a newer area. And you could think about how those are related to each other, but it might be interesting to think about other types of networks if people have ideas. The tissue level. Yeah, I'm just thinking of the amount of spatial data that we're getting uh, through HubMap, through IMS, through Codex, and other microscopy modalities. Something like a spatial co-occurrence network could be quite interesting in looking at the differences be between cell types in that type of network versus some of these single cell things that don't have any spatial information. Cool. Especially spatial, temporal, even. Matt, have you started to think about how to combine the two types of networks at all? Or? Started, yes. We're actually focusing on the first HubMap data release, and we're processing mm -hmm. each data set individually. Mm -hmm. The integrative analysis is going to come after year one. So yeah, essentially started thinking about it as pretty much all. <laughs> well, that seems like a good place to start for these conversations is early, right, when people can contribute the most ideas and then narrow it down, so. I captured some of these questions in the Google Doc, um, also capturing some of the things that were mentioned earlier that we could talk about in the second part of the breakout. So how does data sparsity affect network analysis? Um, what areas of work have been done already in network analysis and, and what can people learn? How can people enter the field? Because I, I, I got a sense that a number of people are wondering what's sort of getting their bearings. And, yeah. um, and then we I captured the spatial, you know, how can spatial data be used for network analysis and, and um, uh, Matt also mentioned uh, temporal data. So those are all great questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with regards to cell-cell interactions, Gary, you mentioned that a lot of it is ligand receptor mapping. Um, and then you make the jump to say that the cells are interacting. I'm wondering if there are um, ways to enrich that data a little bit more, you know, either with the spatial information, with 
uh, inferring net or looking for network activation in the ligated cell, whatever. Um, are there ways that people are doing that that anyone knows on? I think that's a great question too. And um, yes, people are working on that. So there are, I think there are papers, I'll, I'll find some papers on that, but people are developing um, experimental techniques to do that. Um, so they're, they're mapping cell interactions experimentally, uh, including some spatial information. I wonder if another um, thing to think about is what type of data you need to do that, um, because there may be some ways to direct data collection still in some of these Atlas projects to make sure that the most robust modeling can be done. That's kind of my dream world, I guess, where the modeler gets to direct the experiments, but it doesn't happen often. <laughs> I'm just looking for some papers so these other people interject. Mike's chatting some, I think, uh, PubMed IDs, if I'm reading those numbers correctly. Yeah, first I put in a PMID by mistake, <coughs> PM, yeah, PMID, <laughs> then I put in a title and a URL and then another title and a URL and <laughs> I found a little stash, maybe a few of these. Is it possible for you to post those right into the Google Doc? Ah, yeah, sure. Um, where, I got it, Mike. Don't, I got it, Mike. Don't worry about uh, it. Dina's on it. I'm on it. <laughs> I love working with Dina. Thanks, yeah. man. <laughs> Guess we should. If you could send all compliments to Richard Conroy and Betsy Wilder, that'd be great. <laughs> so, Dina, can you like highlight where's the right place to paste this? Oh, I put it in the notes around the disease section. When we were talking about. To, I've got others to add. Okay. Um. Yeah. Let me bold it. I got it. Okay. All right. Is there anyone else that's listening in that has any thoughts or how might we questions that we haven't talked about? It's a pretty big area, I think, so I'm guessing there is. So one, one paper I found um, is uh, talks about paired cell sequencing for spatial gene expression mapping of, of cells. So they, they do single cell sequencing, uh, like a single cell, they apply a single cell sequencing method that, or transcriptomics method, but to pairs of cells. And then mm -hmm. they use a combination of data to uh, identify what those cells are. And because they're stuck together, they, they infer that they came from a tissue uh, next to each other. And then they can also uh, map to spatial information that they've separately collected. So putting, the, you know, that, that one paper puts a whole bunch of information together right. to try and make a cell-cell interaction map over spatial um, scales. So that's from Shalev Itzkovitz at the Weizmann Institute, uh, who um, has a few papers in this area. And I'm going to find other similar groups that are working in that area. So maybe we can we can even brainstorm about what people would love to be able to do, um, because it's maybe early times for network analysis and single cell. I, I have a uh, question so about maybe. whether something fits into this topic. Um, something that's happening within ENCODE, which I don't think is traditionally single cell work, and yet it is by definition single cell work, 
is to use CRISPR-I, CRISPR-KO, and so forth to do perturbations on cells, follow gene regulation as a readout, and then that gives you to some extent a mechanistic or biochemical view of gene regulation. You find hits in certain regions affect gene regulation in cysts. So it's not the standard, let's do a map of um, unperturbed samples. Rather, it's can we do perturbations and then develop a map from this other approach? Mm -hmm. Wait back in a sec, I'm getting interrupted, sorry. Yeah, Mike, I, I, I think that could, could definitely belong in this session. One thing that I'm a little bit hesitant about is thinking about the type of data that people are collecting off of the human samples um, and where's the correct place to perturb those is that you know once you've made an inference of a network and then testing in an independent system or you know, it, there have been some papers recently about um, CRISPR and human organoid systems. Um, I don't know how many people, if there are people on this uh, call right now that are doing that um, and could speak to that. Probably lots of people who are, wish they were doing that and could speak to that. <laughs> Okay, we have some people doing that with primary cells right. and with primary hematopoietic cells, you know, you bypass the whole dissociating the cells and changing their cell state problem. So it's a special case and they're perhaps easier to transduce, but that that's one way to kind of link up what's the survey of the unperturbed cells versus the intervention and what are the changes observed. Yeah. So I suggest we go about this in two ways. Um, we've got two minutes till the break. Uh, there's a list of how might, we, how might we questions in the document. And then there's the uh, approach that Gary suggested, which is what would we love to do? So if we came back in 15 minutes and everyone shared a what would we love to do, I have a feeling that we might converge on some of those questions and maybe a couple of things that we would like to carry forward together. Um, so does that sound like a good plan? Think while you walk around for 15 minutes and then um, hopefully you all come back because I think this is a really fun discussion. Mm. Give me a thumbs up if you're in. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I really liked your prompt right before we went on break, Gary, okay. about what would people love to be able to do? Maybe things they can't do right now. Um, and so I think if, uh, maybe we should start there to see if there are any other things that people want to add to that list. Okay. That sounds good. Do we type or talk? Um, either way, if you would like to talk, I'm happy to type. Or, Nikolai, what would you love to do? Well, um, we want to start probably with single cell or anaesthetic data. And as Adam, we also have uh, disease and we have controls. And we want to see the difference in cell cell interactions uh, that are specific to certain diseases. And from there, I think we want to um, infer or at least narrow down the signaling pathways that, uh, that do, that, you know, provide those differences uh, and, and or uh, are responsible for cell type activation or differentiation. So it is somewhat going from cell-cell interaction network into uh, some signaling network. Okay. 
I've added one more statement there that that from those signaling networks, you want to be able to make some sort of prediction on phenotype or response or. Yes, and and also use it as a more, you know, more uh, narrowed down list of kind of further data collection and uh, perturbation experiments. Yeah. Yeah. Any other, what would we love to do ideas? A Adam, I added some more publications that may or may not illustrate the thing that you're asking about. And Gary and Shannon, are we adding these ideas right below Shannon's start from here or is it in the box below? Right now I'm adding them in the start from here. And then I thought we could decide as a group which ones should be transferred to the box below. Great, thanks. Oh. Yes, I'm catching up and reading a uh, lot of links here to and a lot of papers to look at. So we can add. I can add to 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 the discussion here. I see that one of the subjects we're interested in is there with the with the uh, star. I mean, it's something we we could talk about. We're also interested in time behavior. So we have data, longitudinal data before and after intervention. Uh, so not so much perturbation of cells in the model system, but in humans uh, on, the, on, on uh, admission and then after treatment. So we see differences in the same people. And we also have data at this point, we haven't done single cell, but we have, we have samples continuing this. So we could, we could basically follow changes in disease. Uh, so this kind of temporarily changes in, in networks would be pretty interesting. We expect this is what is happening, but, but again, we're still looking for tools. Uh, to, to model this kind of changes in network behavior. And what kind, of data, what kind of data do you have, Adam? Uh, so we're working on, on samples from sepsis patients. So it's blood, it's, it's uh, peripheral blood cells. Mm -hmm. And again, we, we're monitoring patients, or you know, the data comes from patients in, in six hour increments. Mm -hmm. And the changes are quite dramatic. So, so including some of the patients eventually dying. So. So we see progression either spiraling out of control or, or improving. So we assume that there will be dynamics going back to normal or away from normal. And that single cell RNA-seq data? Yes, or, mm -hmm. well, yes, okay. it's single cell. Mm -hmm. One other network area um, that I forgot to mention earlier is uh, lineage inference. So lineages themselves are networks. And right now they're mostly trees, but I don't think they need to be trees necessarily. So, um, and actually I can, Adam, I can just send, add one um, preprint from my lab that is, uh, that, that talks about that. Um, it's mostly focused on time series, uh, data analysis, but I think it's a bit more generic. It could be used for disease or perturbation, but not, not necessarily um, just time points. So any other ideas that we'd love to do? One, one um, concept that I'm trying to promote personally is the idea of how to use systems biology in the age of single cell genomics. So mostly we've in systems biology, we talk about cell biology and the, the, the human, even uh, like the cancer cell um, and uh, even the human cell atlas, it's kind of focused on the cell. And most of systems biology is focused on how the cell works. Uh, now that we have a lot of information, uh, we have information about many cells. Um, how can we how can we extend the systems biology concepts to tissue um, level? 
So we can think about an ecosystem of cells and instead of focusing on molecular interactions, we can talk about cell interactions. We've already mentioned that in the session, that those cell interactions are dynamic and change over time. So all of the thinking that we put into understanding how the cell works and all the components in the cell, we can extend and think about the tissue level scale. And there are many patterns likely that we might not be able to identify from thinking about an individual cell. So a simple, a simple example is a gradient. So we can't understand anything about a, much about a gradient from looking at one cell. But if we have hundreds of cells, we could see that they're related uh, in a gradient pattern. And there are many other types of patterns we can think about, spatial patterning and things like that. And so those are like a, additional types of information that we can think about from a systems biology perspective at the tissue level of scale. Um, I don't think we've, the, the world has spent a lot of time thinking about the tissue level of scale. There's a lot of people thinking about physiology and individual cells. And so now this tissue level becomes a, a lot more, um, we have a lot more information about it. So there's an interesting conceptual um, activity there. I don't know what other people think about that, other ideas to extend it. Gary, I'd also slightly rephrase that to be emergent properties that I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so if you, if you think about the cell, a gradient, that's important uh, for function. Um, so you can, you can also think about the function of, the, of these patterns. So a gradient might have this very specific function, just like we say a signaling pathway has a function. Yeah. Yeah. Just a comment for the for the networks of cells. Um, we're interested in in inflammatory arthritis, where we have hypotheses about um, the intercellular networks that might be driving the disease. But what we'd like to be able to do from the data is to try and figure out what are the key nodes or the key cells that are actually driving the disease associated circuits. And so in, interested in thinking about what other information you can use to interpret the networks that you build, for example, um, GWAS data and, and things like this. Mm -hmm. So that's a... Um combining different data sources on top of your networks or to build joint networks using different data sources. Does that kind of summarize what you just said? Yeah, I think so. I think it's, you know, what other um, data sources do we have to figure out what are the important nodes in the network? What might okay. be causative in the network, particularly in the context of disease? Okay. I think this is already on our list, but I'd like to advocate for it again. I think a lot of people are interested in either ensemble <clears throat> measurements or purified single cells to learn what cells do, yet an awful lot of biology is cell-cell interaction, and studying the individual cells or the ensemble doesn't reveal that. You know, How does a B cell interact with a T cell, an APC interact with a T cell? You know, how do the zancomal cells and epithelial cells interact to make a hair follicle. You can study the purified cells forever and you never see this biology that happens when the different cells interact. So there's some kind of combination of spatial res resolution in single cells or spatial indexing that allows you to figure out which cells in the cluster came from where. I think that'd be a very important part to learning mm -hmm. to realizing the promise of single cells. So I've kind of um, grouped that, Mike, with uh, Gary's you know, tissue level, so spanning these different scales, um, and then putting a note in there to specifically think about how to take advantage of the spatial interactions and the spatial data that we're collecting. So what I did, and I hope you guys can all see this, is um, bolded maybe four different parts of those um, bullet points that we just talked through and thought, that maybe those might be what we carry on into this next discussion. Um, so. Sounds, sounds great. 
quite literally, I'm just going to copy and paste this down into the next green box. It looks like they've asked us to capture a minimum of five recommendations. So is there another one up there? This looks like four. Um, is there another one up there that you'd like to have copied down into this breakup session part two area? Well, these, these blue boxes that are the recommendations, sometimes they are, there's more than one per topic that, that are hard. There is, yep. I mean, I, I, what I would recommend based on what I saw yesterday was that if we go to our next step of discussion with five, that we end up with no more than three blue boxes um, because we need to have a champion that would want to carry the things in the blue boxes forward. Uh, so Mike can't be the champion for all three of them. So we will um, uh, you know, we'll only want to have a, num a small number of things. I guess that. Um... It might be nice to talk about the funding agency perspective, because I guess there's a number of NIH representatives on the call today. So is there is there anything from that from that perspective that we should discuss, or is that um, should we focus on conceptual science? I don't have a personal preference. Um, maybe I'll speak in Mike and any other NIH people can correct me, but I prefer if we just assume that we've got all of the resources we need and we just want to talk about the conceptual science. I agree. It seems the meeting's more focused on the scientific opportunities than the funding agency perspective. Okay. Well, if you want to see it, then probably CRISPR perturbations would be a great say uh, to add. Okay. Maybe so. we can maybe we can general sort of generalize that to say, per, you know, how can perturb uh, high throughput perturbation assays be used to inform and validate network information? I'll write that. Okay. So should we start discussing these one by one? Is that what you were thinking, Shannon? Yeah, I, I think so. This is a little bit of a more difficult breakout session than something that's like, let's catalog all the metadata, right? Because it's a bit more, we're trying to dive into things that people haven't done yet in conceptual. So um, wherever you want to start, seems like a great idea to me, Gary. <laughs> Um, okay, I mean, I guess we can just go to, I think it's fine that this is uh, conceptual. One of the things we should think about is what action items we'd like to take from this meeting. So, you know, I can, I can, like what's needed in the community in this area. Do we need a review article to be written? Do we need, do we need a, uh, do we need a collection, like a shared collection of, of papers? Do we need, um, uh, do we want to just promote a, a particular concept or an idea that comes out of this in terms of uh, we need to collect specific types of data? So I guess that's, those are the types of things we can think about as action items as we go through the topics. Um, but maybe we, we can just go through the topics one by one. So the, first, the first topic is 
what is the difference in cell-cell interactions? Are these specific to certain diseases? So this was a differential um, This was uh, related to differential network analysis, but on cell-cell interaction level, is that the case? Is that correct? Mike? I feel like this might have, <clears throat> excuse me, this might have merged two topics. I, I heard, how can we use single cell to understand the difference between typical and disease? I also heard, how can we use single cell to look at cell-cell interactions? And this one kind of has the two just together as a single point. Yeah, so um, what I did was move those two things next to each other in the list. Um, Is that okay with people that they're merged? Because I, you know, a good way of coming up with new ideas is merging two existing ideas. <laughs> I guess Nikolai was the one that proposed looking at the differences in cell-cell interactions between disease and um, healthy tissue or between different diseases. So does extending that to the tissue level to look for emergent properties and things also capture what you were thinking about, Nikolai? Yes. So uh, we study pulmonary fibrosis and like several other related diseases in the lung. and. Mm -hmm. Most of them have different cell types interacting between each other in quite a complicated thing that you know brings up the fibrosis in the tissue. So it's it involves interaction and the tissue, and it's not like just you know one cell type starts behaving differently and is the culprit on its own. It's like something. Or the process. Right. One thing that hasn't been done yet in this area is thinking about um, all the different types of cell cell communication that, that exists. I think people have mostly, mostly focusing on autocrine and paracrine signaling mm -hmm. uh, or juxtaposition. People haven't even thought much about juxtacrin that much, like uh, cells touching each other. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's also endocrine signaling through the body, through the blood, right? And, and mm -hmm. that definitely, I haven't seen a single paper on that. Um, so, but, but that's extremely important physiologically and it's probably underlies things like the gut brain axis and these uh, large scale physiological communication systems that we are some of which we're only starting to understand now. Mm -hmm. so, so one pretty interesting area for the human cell atlas could be thinking about how the tissues talk to each other in the body. Um, I think that physiological perspective um, is something that would develop as we map more and more tissues. So naturally people will start with individual cells and tissues of interest, but as we collect more and more information, we'll have the whole body map, you know, many parts of the whole body mapped. So, um, and we, we already know lots of examples in biology of how these systems talk to each other with, with uh, hormones, for instance. I think that's really interesting um, concept, the endocrine. Um, from the angle I come from, we think about more inflammation and there can be systemic cytokine signaling. And there, you know, you can imagine you have the same network in a tissue, but it behaves differently because the environment has changed. And how you detect that is going to be quite different as, you, as you're alluding to from how you detect a cell-cell interaction. Mm -hmm. So thinking about the session we're in then, um, I can think of a few different types of modeling approaches that you might take. And I'm wondering, are there different types of modeling approaches that would need to be combined in order to describe those systems? And have you seen anyone do that or should we catalog what we know? Might be interesting to think about disease 
disease areas and um, biological concepts that are dependent on that, that, that may provide a driving biological project or question for that type of activity. Like I mentioned, the gut-brain connection, but there are probably many others that people could are aware of. Um, or even, even um, you know, a, a colleague of mine studies puberty, and that's a multi-system, you know, uh, it's a multi-system body change, right? So um, um, that that would be another example. So it's it's uh, the hypothalamus, and it affects many other parts of the body, like uh, adipose tissue and um, um, uh, other, you know, sex organs, etc. And um, there's there's a lot of communication, endocrine communication signaling there. So what other kind of important endocrine biology uh, could we think about? So how are people modeling that? Is that mostly in compartmentalized PKPD type of models? Are they, um, you know, inference models or how, how are people writing those down? I haven't seen any single cell perspective on that. Um, I'm sure people, and I'm actually not familiar how people in the physiology world model these things. Um, I have some general concepts about how it would work, but does anyone else know? Kind of an interesting question. Do we, should we, is this an interesting connection to physiology? Because I think there's a lot of physiology, physiology modelers, mm -hmm. um, actually, mathematical modeling of um, blood flow and um, muscle movements and um, obviously the uh, you know neural conduction and those types of things have been a mainstay of physiology for decades and um, you know I, there probably aren't any single cell perspectives on those um, but maybe that's an, an interesting area like a uh, an opportunity to uh, generate a lot of ideas by bringing in some physiology modelers into this community to make those connections. That would be a cool action item. Mm -hmm. like you could imagine a session at a conference that links single cell technology to uh, physiology modeling and discussion or even a workshop on that topic. Mm -hmm. I guess we're not supposed to figure out how to do this, but I can't help but wonder how to do this. Would some of this be, start with model organisms, um, give them perturbations that you know would change their global physiology, and then look for known markers of endocrine signaling and different single cell subtypes and see can you detect that propagation across the body? I mean, one other system would be uh, sleep with melatonin and circadian rhythm. Yeah, circadian rhythm is, is a great example. And people have already studied that on the gene expression, how that, how that affects the gene expression level. Um, I'll send a paper about that, but I haven't seen it mapped to single cell gene expression. And um, although it's been discussed a lot as an important confounding factor, because people knew that it's important, an important confounding factor from looking at bulk RNA-seq data. Yeah, I remember in some of the mini controversy about how much is the mouse immune response like the human immune response. Somebody realized, oh yeah, well we do those experiments with the mice in the morning and people in the morning and mice are nocturnal and sure enough, if you get the cells from the mice at the end of the day when they're in the same circadian rhythm spot, the Safe teachers get even more similar to human. Okay. Um, it looks like 
someone copy and pasted and we lost a lot of our text. <laughs> um, so I just want to make sure that we recapture some of what we were saying. So there was a discussion about this good discussion about um, including uh, endocrine behaviors or capturing endocrine signaling in uh be able to go back in the um revision history yeah i'll try and do that okay Parallel. thanks um dean and i will just wait till Lot of edits, so we'll take a few minutes. You guys, okay. <laughs> So actually, I think while Gary does that, um, this seems like a rather concrete thing that we could enter into one of the blue boxes below, um, which would be, I'll, I'll take a stab at a title and then you guys correct me, um, incorporating physiology into uh, cell cell models or incorporating give me a better title um cell cell modeling of physiology maybe long range endocrine effects okay network modeling of cell cell interaction about expanding cell cell interaction models to include long range signaling. That sounds good. I like it. Okay. Um, yeah, I found the information, so hopefully that's. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, so the problem that we think we can solve by collaborating in this area would be to uh, incorporate multi-scale modeling, increase the scales of that we cross, what would be the One, one thing would just be to predict what long range signals you think are, are affecting the cellular environment. Mm -hmm. Which um, in disease, so one example of this would be, there's a type of arthritis called ankylosing spondylitis where you get joint inflammation. And in a mouse model, you can reproduce all the symptoms by overexpressing a cytokine, IL-23, in the liver. And then you get peripheral symptoms everywhere. Um, so you have a long-range signal that then changes all, what, how all the local networks are behaving. Okay. So in a human disease, you know, if you could predict that there's some long range cytokine signaling that might be causing the change in the network behavior that you're seeing, that would be really exciting. And you yeah. will probably not discover that just from modeling the network in isolation. You'd need some other data sets where you knew about sort of the generic effects of these signals. I think an important 
contribution of single cell technology is this mechanistic understanding. Um, and so a lot of these physiological processes may not have had molecular mechanism understanding that, you know, that we might, some of them do, but um, that's the opportunity with single cell genomics because we, there's a, such a huge amount of molecular detail measured. And if it can be linked to those processes, then you, you might, for instance, be able to identify the hormones involved or, you know, specific molecules. And, and that would be, you know, if you identify those, you'd also want to validate that they, that they work, that they work as you expect. So maybe that also raises the question of how these things are validated in physiologic, you, you, I guess you'd need whole animal models um, sometimes for these things. So I'll, I'll just add um, something about that. I, I think I might've captured that in the last bullet under, um, it says single cell genomics may bring a molecular mechanism point of view to a okay. physical process. Sorry. Sorry, I was looking at the blue box. Oh, yeah, and I can, yeah. Um. I don't know if this is part of the inspiration for this, but I'm thinking of that recent smoking type 2 diabetes uh, link, and you could study the pancreas forever and document all the changes, but unless you knew to look to the brain for signaling to the pancreas, you would never get at that upstream event, you would only find those downstream events. Right. So what are some um, kind of recommendations or concrete next steps that people would be interested in pursuing to start thinking and working on this problem? I just want to mention one more quick one that I remembered, which is um, this link between me somatic mutations in the blood that are associated with aging, or ARCH, or age-related clonal uh, hematopoiesis, and cardiovascular disease. It was mm -hmm. um, published a couple of years ago in New England Journal of Medicine, um, which is pretty, pretty interesting, and people don't know how that works at all, but it, it might underlie, might be a molecular explanation for a large fraction of cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll find the paper. So that sort of also brings in the, the whole aging idea. Unless I'm mistaken, some people have done single cell analysis on some GTEC samples and said from the RNA, you can see clonality in some of the cells or somatic, somatic mutation in some of the cells. So that suggests that in more standard settings, you could also look for somatic mutations or mosaicism. I think that was a broad paper last year. So Gary had suggested um, trying to bring together single cell genomics folks or single, whatever Atlas experiment of your choice folks to uh, together with the physiologically, physi physiological modeling community. Does anyone have any um, ties there or any conferences that they could suggest that we potentially look at? You know, are there are there groups at the presumably there are sections of the NIH that that focus on this area? Which institute? That NIGMS maybe. Maybe, could be. Yeah. Um, 
I'm guessing there's a lot of different groups based on modeling uh, drug response and drug interactions and things like that, where they're using kind of these lump parameter models to do that. Um, we can identify some people in that space. This might be a really great thing to for someone to stand up in the soapbox two minute opportunity at the end of the day and say, we need to identify these people. Are they on the, are they at the conference? Can they go into our uh, virtual room and help us? And one, one conference that might include some of these people is the International Conference of Systems, Systems Biology. Yeah. I'll put a link to that currently scheduled for October 2020 in Hartford, Connecticut. People think this is a good one to spend a short time at the end of the day asking about. I think it's a good idea. So is there someone or a couple people even better that would be willing to be kind of the champions for this particular topic and would be interested in moving it forward? I'm happy to present it at the People think that's a good idea. Um, I don't know what I can do after that. <laughs> I think it's good to get that conversation started, though. Okay. I think it's it's it's. I think many people will agree that it's more of a downstream goal for the HCA because people are still quite busy just mapping the tissues that they're that they're interested in right now, and it probably will take a while before people really get to the point where they're collect, there's so much data that they're really now thinking about how to link it all together, but perhaps preparing for that is a great idea. So I think people like the idea of preparing for it, although I'm not sure how many people will take it up right away for activities, although there might be, might be some people, so it's worth broadcasting. Steve, this seemed like an area that you're particularly interested in as well. Yes, it is um, from the disease angle. Um, so yeah, I'd be happy for Gary to present it um, and keep talking okay. about how it can be done. It's not clear to me exactly how you would model this at the moment. Um, so that's a conversation that could be had, but yeah, I hadn't really thought about, about this much, but having had this conversation, I think it's actually really, really important going forward for people when they model these local networks you just can't really do it without knowing the environment status that the networks are sitting in. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there a current working group in any of the programs that you guys are associated with that takes up this type of a conversation? What I really want to try to do at the end of this meeting is just for everyone to say, oh, we need to form a new working group because everybody's got so much stuff going on already that it's never going to work that way. Um, I mean, it doesn't necessarily need to be a working group. It could be just seeding a session or a workshop. Uh, yeah. So it could be identifying people who are interested because not all of these ideas are going to have enough critical mass to move them forward at this mm -hmm. moment. So, um, but so if there, there is critical mass, then you can move it forward. So I guess that's the first step is identifying if there's critical mass. Yep. Well, and that's what we are, yeah. we're, uh, we started working on modeling cell cell interactions from single cell data, uh, mapping in out more, a little bit more accurately, maybe spatially validated later on. Um, but 
generally do we want to put the review um, as an action item that we need or at least you know um, compile a list of papers for that I think it's a good idea and just to have some sort of resource where the interested people can go back to um, yeah, I wonder, so one thing that's really open is the HCA Slack channels. And I wonder if there is, does anyone know if there's a cell cell interaction Slack channel under that group? And if there isn't, maybe that would be a good place to um, drop a bunch of papers and uh, articles like Nikolai is suggesting, ask for input feedback. There isn't one. There is one on the, C the CZI science one, but um, it hasn't gotten a lot of um, activity in a long time. It's just created around one of the CZI meetings. It would be okay. more appropriate to have it in the HCA because not everybody's part of CZI. Yeah, I, I, so, right. yeah so, so I'll create a channel there. Try to come up with a good name. Cell cell interactions is one that maybe we want to talk more generally about. Um, tissue ecosystems or something. Mm -hmm. Or cellular Is there ecosystem? a separate, uh, separate Slack for HCA, not CZI, right? Yeah, there's an HCA Slack channel. Steve, do you think that under the blue box that we're filling in and the problem that we think we can solve by collaborating, could you expand a little bit on those two bullets to add what thoughts you just conveyed if, if they're not conveyed there? Um, just thinking about how to convey the, ex the excitement of this problem to others as we, as this gets pasted somewhere. Cool. I'm just working on this channel on HCA Slack because if we make one, then we can announce it today if we get a plenary slide. Awesome. Um, what did you say you were going to name it? Um, I'm just looking for other channels that have maybe similar names because there's, okay. there are actually a huge number of channels <laughs> on there. Yeah. Yeah, so there isn't anything. So I'll probably call it Cell Ecosystem. Cell ecosystem, does that sound okay to people? Or would you rather, you know, cell cell interactions is more understandable maybe? Anyone have a preference? Okay, I'm gonna call it cell ecosystem. Should we move on to the next topic or is there anything else on the action item side of things to capture? Sounds like we should move on, right? I think so. Um, while we are moving we, on. Yeah, I guess we, oh. okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Thanks, Gary. Um, 
under the names with consortia on the team in the blue box, if people who are interested could fill in their names and their email addresses, and we can do that while we're moving on to the next topic, I think that that will be helpful. Okay, that, that channel is being created. If anyone's on the HCA Slack workspace, they can join it. Um, it's, it's called Cell Dash Ecosystems. Is that channel open to people who aren't on HCA? Anyone can join the, so I think there might be a way of sharing a channel globally outside of the Slack workspace. I haven't experimented with that feature. Okay. But, um, let me, um, I mean, you don't have to do it now. I was just curious. Yeah. So there's a link that it generates that maybe if you click on it automatically helps you join it. So I guess we kind of got into this discussion. Um, some of these topics led together. So we're talking about certain diseases and um, kind of talked about how to, the, the systems biology ecosystem idea, but we, we broadened it out to even full physiology. Is there a particular topic that people want us to talk about next, like temporal or disease, not disease analysis, or the, the high throughput perturbation experiments. Adam or Nikolai, what would you think? So I'm just busy reading some of the papers which you linked, gave links to. So, uh, well, we definitely have a lot of catching up to do. Um, so do you want to, do you want to um, brainstorm around a particular topic in a bit more depth? Okay, otherwise I'm gonna choose one, I guess, which is, um, but maybe, maybe we can talk more about the ecosystem of cells and what it means. Like I, I mentioned this idea of a gradient and the gradient can have a function. So just like genes have functions. So, so we know a lot about the systems biology area has developed so many interesting concepts and in trying to understand how the cell works. Like, and it's not just systems biology, but for instance, gene function. We have the gene ontology, we have information about different aspects of gene function, um, path processes that they participate in, where they're located, their molecular enzymatic function, for instance. So how could we translate that to a tissue level? So I can imagine a gradient might have some kind of function like filtering or something like that, or obviously there's probably a lot of development. So maybe we could brainstorm about what biological, um, like if you were to create a gene ontology, but for multicellular structures, um, what would you, what would you do? And, and focus on the function, like the mechanistic function, because we're, I guess we're talking about systems. So you can, you can think about that spatially, like this is just the, the bud of a limb or something. Um, but systems biology is more about how systems are working, so processes. Mm 
So, so Gary, I have questions about what kinds of things would be included in this or not. Like I think there's a part of brain development that proceeds as a wave goes rostral caudal. So if you look at one instant of time, you'd find different levels of development, though all of the cells are transitioning to terminally differentiated. Or if you look within skin, inside to outside, outside you have terminally differentiated cells, inside you have basal cells, and then there's this constant renewal. So again, if you take a spatial slice, you can see that timeline and see things that are happening. But there that's a steady state that you've already always have basal cells and terminally differentiated cells. Are, are those kinds of things in this idea or not? Or if you think about skin and hair, you've got your layer of um, epithelial cells, keratinocytes, and your layer of fibroblasts. And at rare sites, there's an inductive signal, black code forms, and then you get this hair follicle that forms, and then all these other new cell fates and states form from that pre-existing layer of just two cell types. So again, you get this spatial resolution and cell-cell contact information and sharing. Are, are all of those things in or some of them? Yeah, I, I suppose they're all in it. As you were talking about that, I was just thinking that the gene ontology probably already has a bunch of terms related to those things because they're, they're, they've identified genes that are important in the function of those, those processes, right? So um, I guess this would be somehow you'd, you'd extend it to cell types that are important. And um, maybe one other thing we can think of is, is when, um, you know, so, so the gene ontology has the, like in the biological process aspect has uh, a huge number of, you know, tens of thousands of terms specializing all, all, you know, that are highly specialized, all areas of biology. But there's also um, uh, this idea that you have modules that repeat their use multiple times. So a gradient might be more like a module. Like it's like, okay, I see a gradient here. I know what that concept is. Gradient is used in this uh, hair follicle thing, for instance, that you mentioned. Um, and so those might be different aspects of, just like gene ontology has different aspects of gene function, we might have different aspects of tissue level structures or something like that. So the way I interpreted that on this sheet of paper here is um, how would you create a hierarchy that would represent these cells or modules to describe tissue function or tissue construction? Is that an accurate way to write yeah. that down? Yeah, okay. that would be great. I mean, okay. not to get pedantic, hi everyone. Um, gene ontology isn't strictly a hierarchy. Okay. Ontologies aren't hierarchies, so cool. if you, it, it just, it confuses the universe if you start using ontology when you mean hierarchy. Uh, is there a better word that you'd prefer that I use there? Well, I think you should use, oh, I haven't looked at your, let me look at your, what you wrote. Um, I'm, I'll uh, put it in red so you know what I'm talking about. Okay. How to create. Well, um, one thing is that um, mo as I understand it, most gene ontologies uh, were done before um, single cell thing, and they are actually masking many different things that are happening uh, with some phenotype or you know feature they're describing. So, um, but generally, I like uh, your idea to kind of try to create a, a little bit high level ontology uh, that would describe a group of cells uh, which are either a subpopulation of some certain cell type or you know have the specific feature that will uh, interact with others and so on. Well, if I interpret Gary correctly, what I think he wants is a set of labels that he can apply to collections of cell states, which we might call like a tissue. Is that a fair abstraction or is that too specific? Yeah, I mean, that's, the cell state idea is interesting as well. I mean, this, this is all fresh. These are all fresh ideas. So, yeah. um, you know, States 
like a collection of cells and cell states. Um, so you can say there's there's a number a certain number of cells, and then they can have uh, types and states. And those things can be even, even kind of overlaying on each over overlapping. You can a cell can be in multiple states mm -hmm. at the same time. Like it could be in a cell cycle state plus a inflammation state. I I think you're I, I, I now I see your 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 ontology analogy here is sort of and this is where the word hierarchy comes into is that it it's like a graph or a you know in computer science like a um, that's what I was thinking about a set of um you know mix in classes <laughs> I don't know why that's the analogy that popped in my head but uh, yeah okay uh, I'll look at your your wording. Um, and, and think, ponder it for a second. We can move on because I well, right it. now it's three question marks waiting for. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I'm going to look at. It. Uh, I'll look at it right now. So Gary, might might the cell states be cell fate plus signaling pathway activated? So you could have like you know this cell plus Wnt signaling, or this cell plus retinoic acid signaling, or the cell yeah. plus insulin signaling, and then you would have evidence of that by downstream gene regulation events? Are you thinking something like that? Yeah, yeah, that's the way I think about, about it, that, these, that, that you have overlapping transcriptional programs. That's the oh, way no. I think about cell states. So we have 15 minutes till lunch. I think this seems like a really cool blue box to fill in, um, super interesting. So, uh, I'm going to. So, so I added a blue box already about it, but I didn't okay, put cool. anything in. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to cut and paste uh, or copy some of the things that we're talking about right down to that blue box, and then we can maybe call it a little bit um, like that uh, to make those more descriptive or challenge based. Um, Okay, Ben, are you still working a lot with gene ontology? No, <laughs> not at all. I mean, okay. there's someone in our office that I no longer go to that's in the gene ontology. <laughs> She's the yeast expert anyway. I mean, but I know the people. I, I don't, I actually suspect that, well, uh, you know, Chris Mungle was actually on one of these. He's in at this meeting, of course. I don't know which of the 27 breakout sessions he's in. But I would ping him about that. I suspect you don't want to bolt this on to the gene ontology per se. Um, I think you just want to think about how. It, I, I see it, it, this. I actually kind of. It's interesting. This came up in like this really high level network dynamical modeling session. Like it seems that the type of thing you're 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 conceiving of needs to apply at a much lower level, like actually, you know, at the, at the sort of cell type descriptor level. But I have to say that I'm not even, I'm way behind this single cell uh, data too. I was just hoping to learn some stuff. So maybe, maybe that's more well established, but I think there might be some, um, like the concept of a gene ontology makes sense and you would cross link it, but I don't think you would want to, like the gene ontology specifically has one purpose. That is to describe the function of a gene product. That's what it's for, right? It labels processes and uh, cellular components and biochemical functions based on gene products, proteins or RNAs that have those properties. But that's what, that's what an ontology is. It's a description of gene products in cells. So if you're talking about a description of uh, higher level systems, biochemical genetics, or whatever it is we're talking about, right? Like that's a separate, like that's what an ontology is. It's a description of something in the real. So, that, yeah. so it, the concept I, is the same, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily. Yeah, I wanted to push back a little bit on that actually, because I guess the way I was thinking about how this was going is in you know utopia environment that I live in, um, 
you'd have your gene ontology that describes the molecular behaviors of the cell and how that manifests the cell into a specific phenotype, but then maybe you bridge that into this more cellular ontology that Gary's talking about. And that's one way to build these more multi-scale models that people talk about all the time, but have not really been as successful in actually constructing. Oh yeah, no, that totally makes sense. I just, maybe I misunderstood Gary. I thought he meant to actually put this into the gene ontology, which is an entity. That, what that I, I, that I, the, so I, I must have just misinterpreted you. Well, well, what I was, I, I was, sorry, I wasn't clear. What I was wondering about is if the gene ontology people have thought about how to extend their, their work. Um, you could write a, they could write a whole grant about this idea, I'm sure. But, you know, because yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's a new topic. Um, but, you know, yeah, the, the point is, the, the aim would be to describe a, the function of a group of cells. Yeah, I would, I would definitely like ping Chris on that. He's involved in not just gene ontology, but also Uberon, which is a really uh, important tissue ontology, which I'm sure, see, it, it, I could see it, it branching off from Uberon too. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think it's really a side effect for, <clears throat> a side story for us, because I think we got into this because we were wondering how to classify networks because networks belong on every, you know, depend on everything else. So network in, in a given state would be different than the network in other state. So I think this is how we got into this, this ontology thing, because it's hard yes. to, to, to define what we're actually modeling, right? If we're modeling a disease state, or modeling a healthy state and the brain interacts with this. So we want to classify what we're actually modeling, right? This is how we got into this ontology thing, but we still haven't answered how to model anything. No. <laughs> I, mean, I, I see it as an ex I see it as an extension of the network motif work, so which is um, you know trying to think about structures at the network level. Um, so this would be something similar, be like a cellular motif. So you could think about how you model that, and you, again, just the simple idea of a gradient. How do you model that as, as a system? So it, I think from a systems perspective or systems biology perspective, it it makes things it makes sense to think about how you think about this as a like how you define the system. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking. But I, I agree with you that it, you know. So do you want to suggest uh, topics uh, like uh, um, ways to talk about the modeling aspect of it? I think we are all torn between between trying to understand the realistic system where we have to, uh, to know what, what specific state it is in and, and map distant interactions or influences on versus modeling, you know, technical aspect of how we model any group of cells and, and multiple levels of, of you know, cells and interactions interacting with, with intercellular networks and so on. Do you want to talk about that? We have, I think we have 10 minutes left or something like that. Well, all I have are questions, so I don't know really how to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think um, uh, trying to define what, what the next steps are to answer your questions might be a good place for what we put in this recommendation, what we want to do box. Um, it's obviously easier said than done, but. I mean, we could also just go over, I mean, there are other topics that we didn't talk about, um, like what types of data we would want to collect to make these things happen, like the causal um, network inference data from perturbation. So that's a whole, it's a whole other, a whole additional area. Um, or we could go through these blue boxes and just verify that they're capturing all the information. Maybe it's best to do that afterwards offline. Blue boxes, everybody can review them offline. Okay. Can use 
more valuable in-person time for, for new ideas. So in the last few minutes, should we talk about the causal network inference? Topic. So does anyone want to mention anything about that? Takis, I know you're on the call, but I haven't heard you, but I know you've worked in this area. I don't know if you're listening. Sorry, what did you say, uh, Daddy? Um, just, just wondering about the area of causal network inference and perturbations. Yes, yeah, so we, how, we, have, we, we have done. We have done some work on the causal inference in the last five years or so, both in terms of theoretical aspects, not specifically for single cell data, but I'll tell you how the single cell data come into play. Um, so we have done uh, some work both on the theoretical aspects on how to learn causal graphs uh, on uh, mixed uh, data types, so continuous and discrete variables, as well as many applications in, in uh, medicine uh, from building uh, predict or predictive models to learn what is the um, uh, possible causes or influences of an outcome uh, in diseases like COPD, lung cancer, and so on, using all sorts of data from um, clinical data and protein biomarkers in the blood to um, uh, low dose CT scan features extracted by radiologists and so on. Now, uh, very recently, a few months ago, we published a, um, a paper to use causal graph networks to learn uh, network perturbations on a single sample. Uh, and the way that we do that, we, we uh, learn a, let's say, a reference network from a set of reference samples using um, causal inference algorithms. Um, and then every single sample that comes, no matter if it's from uh, controls or from, from disease, you can uh, look, we look on um, which parts of this reference network is perturbed and by how much. And we do that by um, building predictors for each gene, let's say, that we have based on the Markov blanket around it, and then measure how far away the predicted value on a given sample is from the um, actual measured value for this gene on that. And that gives us how far away the genes are with respect to the reference network, but not just by gene expression, but how far they were um, if we were to predict them based on their surrounding in the network. So that. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. And this, we applied it also on single cell data because once you have that for all the genes on that, how much uh, perturbation occur, um, you can use this vector to do clustering of the patients. You can find disease um, subgroups or subclassification of disease, or you can find um, different cell types on the single cell data. Um, mm -hmm. So we have done both actually on the publication. We have, um, we applied it on both um, single cell data from um, uh, mouse liver development and on TCGA data uh, to identify uh, sub, uh, sub uh, disease, uh, sub phenotypes of, of disease. That's all. Great. Yeah, I put that's an interesting paper. I, I, I added the link on Google Doc. So what kind of information would you, Takis, would you like to see mapped to improve our ability to do this type of causal modeling? Like every gene, CRISPR, uh, you know, CRISPR that, deleted and overexpressed. Right. That, that will be the next challenge that we are working on, on uh, to see how we can combine now um, uh, perturbation experiments with observation, because currently we only have observational data, right? So we learn the, the causal graphs based on observational data alone. Um, we do have uh, some algorithm on how to incorporate prior information into the network, but we would like to see how we can marry the observational data with the um, uh, perturbation uh, data on that. We, we don't have that. But yeah, if we had data like that, that will be one of the things that uh, will be great. Mm -hmm.
Um, okay, I think we're almost out of time. Is that correct? Yep. So it looks like we we really populated two blue boxes that people were interested in moving forward, or at least definitely one with regards to the long range signaling and its effect on cell cell interactions. Um, and then the other one was uh, um, creating an ontology to describe functions of groups of cells. Um, are people I guess interested people in both of those? I guess we should yeah, figure out who's interested in these because they're, while they're interesting ideas, we might not have anyone who's actually ready to work on them right now. But uh, we could, you know, next steps could be just trying to uh, discuss the idea with other people. Like for the ontology, we can talk about it with Chris Mungle, who's mm -hmm. uh, one of the architects of gene ontology. And um, for the physiology um, one, I don't know if we have a, um, I guess we have a Slack channel to. Yeah, that's a great concrete output. And um, would you, uh, how would you feel about being the example soapbox before we go to our next breakout session to give everyone an idea of how that'll work at the end of the day? That's the, I guess, perk you get with having me in the room. <laughs> I can, I can elevate us. <laughs> um, oh, oh, that's the plenary <laughs> session after the lunch break? Yeah, so we need, we need someone to volunteer to give the two, first two minute soapbox to say, here's one problem we identified, um, here's what's exciting about it, and here's our concrete next step. So since we already took that concrete next step to uh, create the Slack channel, this seems like a, a nice example of what kind of thing we're gonna be looking at, looking for. For these soapboxes at the end of the day. At the, at the end of the day, right? Yeah, I can. I, that was yeah. I, I volunteered earlier. I'm happy to to do it. Um, unless someone else wants to do it or combine, like um, Steve. Um, but the also there was an idea that we ask for something so that we discussed, re, you know, identifying other people to join that Slack channel, especially links to the computational physiology community. Yeah, that's a great ask. Any other ideas? I guess traditionally these multi-scale collaborations have been difficult. Um, I know in systems biology, the protein-protein interaction community has had trouble connecting with the mathematical modeling community for a long time. And um, so I guess we should, we'd, it'd probably be good to identify specific collaborative projects that would need to be, need to happen to verify that this is a good, good way of connecting. And that seems like a lot to bite off for right now and maybe something to start thinking about on the Slack channel or once people start talking. And, um, I'm, I'm particularly really interested in this. So anything that I can do to help facilitate meetings or next steps from the NIH side, um, I'm happy to do that as well. Okay, great.